Hey folks, welcome back. In this video, we're going to go over section one, i.e. the multiple choice questions from the 2022 SQA National 5 Physics exam paper. Now, there are 25 questions in this section, and I recommend that you try them yourself before looking at these solutions. So let's get into it. Question 1 says which of the following contains one scalar quantity and one vector quantity? Well remember a scalar quantity is one that has a magnitude or size only, whereas a vector quantity is one that has both a magnitude or size and a direction. Well if we look at A first of all, acceleration and displacement are both vectors. For B, kinetic energy and speed are both scalars. For C, velocity and weight are both vectors because remember weight is a type of force and force is a vector, so weight must also be a vector. For D, we have potential energy and work, i.e. work done, which is also a type of energy, so these are both scalars. And lastly, we have distance and force, where distance is a scalar and force is a vector, so our answer here has got to be E. Question 2 says the diagram shows a toy car at rest on the top of a slope. The car is released and travels with a constant acceleration down the slope. So here's our toy car and we've got points P and Q. It then says which row in the table could show the speed of the toy car at P, the speed of the toy car at Q, and the average speed of the car between P and Q. Well firstly we need to realise that the speed of the toy car will increase as it moves down the slope from P to Q, i.e. it will accelerate. Therefore its speed at Q must be greater than its speed at P. So we want to have a greater value in this column than we have in this column. However, the speed at P cannot be 0 meters per second since the toy car is already moving when it reaches point P. And lastly, for this average speed column, we should know how to get an average, which is that the average speed value must be equal to the sum of the speeds at P and Q divided by 2. So we can firstly rule out option B because that shows that the speeds at P and Q are the same, which is not going to be possible here. And remember we said the speed at P cannot be 0 since the toy car is already moving. So we can rule out option A as well. So that means we're looking at C, D and E which all have a speed at Q which is greater than the speed at P but we need the average speed to make sense with these numbers. So for option C if we do 1 plus 3 that gives us 4 meters per second and then divide it by our two results gives us 2 meters per second. So that means our answer is going to be C here because that makes sense. Whereas if we do it for D and E, you'll see we get 2 plus 3 is 5, divided by 2 would be 2.5. And if we rounded that up, that would give us 3 meters per second, not 2. And lastly for E, 2 plus 3 again gives us 5, divide that by 2, it gives us 2.5, and that rounds up to 3, not 4. So our only possible answer here, it must be C. Question 3 says the graph of speed v against time t represents the motion of a cyclist over a 20 second period. So here we have speed v in meters per second and time t in seconds and you'll see that the speed starts at 4 meters per second and increases up to 10 over 8 seconds and then it continues at a constant speed until 20 seconds. Then says the distance travelled by the cyclist in the 20 second period is. Well remember if you're given a speed time graph or a velocity time graph and you want to find the distance or displacement from that graph then you need to find the area under the graph. So we can write the distance is equal to the area under the velocity time graph. And for calculating the areas, we want to split the graph into some easy shapes. So we're going to split this one into a rectangle and a triangle. So we can split it up along here like so. And let's label our three areas, 1, 2 and 3. So down here we can say this is equal to the length times breadth for area 1, that's our rectangle plus a half times base times height for a triangle here, plus the length times breadth for this rectangle here. And we can then put in our numbers. So for the first rectangle, we have 8 for the length times 4 for the breadth, so that's 8 times 4, plus a half times the base for this triangle is again 8. So we have a half times 8 times 6 for the height because it starts at 4 and it ends at 10. Plus length times breadth for this rectangle, we're going from 8 to 20, which is a length of 12, times the height there, which is the full 10. So putting that all into your calculator should give you an answer of 176 meters, which is option D. Question 4 says a student is investigating the motion of water rockets. Air is pumped into the rocket until the pressure of the air inside is large enough for the water rocket to launch upwards. The rocket launches because the rocket pushes down on the ground and the ground provides a reaction force pushing up on the rocket. The rocket pushes down on the water and the water provides a reaction force pushing up on the rocket. The water pushes down on the ground and the ground provides a reaction force pushing up on the water. The force applied by the water on the ground is greater than the weight of the rocket, producing an unbalanced upward force. Or lastly, the weight of the rocket decreases as water is pushed out of the rocket, producing an unbalanced upward force. Well, if we think about Newton's third law here in terms of rockets, a common misconception for pupils in this sort of situation is to think that the water is going to push off the ground and it's the reaction force to the ground pushing back on the water, which is going to cause the water to launch. However, 
However, the ground isn't really playing a part in our Newton pair of forces here. And we can use the picture to think about what's going on here. Due to the pressurized air inside the rocket, the rocket itself is going to push the water downwards and the water is then going to push back on the rocket. And you'll see the closest to that is option B here. The rocket pushes down on the water and the water provides a reaction force pushing up on the rocket. Question 5 says a ball of mass 0.25 kilograms is released from a height of 6.0 meters above the ground. So you can see the ball released from 6 meters above the ground there and we're interested in what happens through the motion of the ball from 6 meters above the ground to 4 meters above the ground. It then says which row on the table shows a change in gravitational potential energy and the kinetic energy of the ball when it's at a height of 4.0 meters above the ground. Well to find the change in gravitational potential energy first of all, because the ball is moving from a higher point to a lower point, we can say it's going to lose gravitational potential energy. So let's say the loss in EP, the loss in gravitational potential energy, is equal to mgh, just using the equation EP equals mgh. So we have 0.25 for the mass times 9.8 newtons per kilogram on Earth times 6.0 minus 4.0 to go through that change in height. So putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 4.9 joules. So that means we have options B or D here. Then to find the kinetic energy, we can use the conservation of energy here. So we can say that the loss in gravitational potential energy is going to be equal to the gain in kinetic energy of the ball. So that means we can say that EK is equal to 4.9 joules as well, which gives us the answer B. Question 6 says astronauts orbiting in the International Space Station experience weightlessness. A group of students make the following statements to explain weightlessness in the orbiting space station. Statement 1 says the gravitational field strength inside the space station is zero. Statement 2, the space station and astronauts are both accelerating at the same rate towards Earth. And statement 3, the forces acting on the astronauts are balanced. Which of these statements is or are correct? Well, for that first one, the gravitational field strength inside the space station is zero, that is false. And it's a common misconception for pupils to think that the gravitational field strength or gravity is zero in space. And that's just wrong because there's gravity everywhere. But it's just going to be a weaker gravitational field strength on the space station than it is on Earth, for example. So we can say that one's false. And statement two, the space station and astronauts are both accelerating at the same rate towards the Earth. Well, that one is true and that explains why the astronauts will feel that feeling of weightlessness, that sort of floating effect on board the space station. And it's because the vehicle that they're in is accelerating at the same rate as they are towards the Earth. And lastly, statement three, the forces acting on the astronauts are balanced. Well, the space station and the astronauts can't be accelerating towards the Earth if there are balanced forces acting on them. So that means there must be an unbalanced force acting on the astronauts causing them to accelerate. So therefore this third statement must be false. There must be unbalanced forces, not balanced forces. So that means we have two only as the correct one here, which is answer B. Question seven says, which of the following lists the distances from longest to shortest? Well, if we think about our options here, we've got radius of Earth, radius of orbit of Moon, and the diameter of a galaxy and we want to go from longest to shortest. So that means we're going to have diameter of the galaxy first. We're then going to have the radius of the orbit of the moon because the distance between the Earth and the moon is bigger than the radius of the Earth. And that means our shortest distance will be the radius of the Earth. So that gives us the answer C here. The diameter of the galaxy is the longest, then the radius of orbit of the moon, and then the radius of the Earth. Question 8 says three satellites X, Y, and Z are orbiting the Earth as shown. So here we have X closest to the Earth, then Y, and then Z, and it says satellite Z is a geostationary satellite. Which row in the table shows possible periods for the orbits of satellites X, Y, and Z? Well, if we think about what we know about geostationary satellites, first of all, we know that geostationary satellites have an orbital period of 24 hours. So that means that satellite Z here must have a period of orbit of 24 hours, which means we can limit our answers to A, C, and D, but we can rule out B and E. And if we look back at the picture, we know that Z is furthest away from the Earth, which means X and Y should take a shorter time to orbit the Earth because they're closer, so they have less distance to travel. So we can say both X and Y must have shorter orbital periods than Z, i.e. less than 24 hours since they are closer to the Earth. And we've said that X must have the shortest orbital period since it's closest to the Earth. So if we look at our options here, you see this one for C has 24 for all the orbital periods, so it's not going to be that one. And then the other options were this one here for D, but you'll see that this gives us greater orbital periods for X and Y, which means our only possible answer is A, where 12 hours is the shortest for satellite X, then we have a longer period of orbit of 18 hours for satellite Y, and then 24 hours for the period of orbit of satellite Z. So our answer here must be A. 
Question 9 says a spacecraft has four rocket engines, P, Q, R and S, and is travelling to the right as shown. So it's moving to the right and we have these four rocket engines, P, Q, R and S. When switched on, each rocket engine produces the same amount of force. It then says which rocket engines are switched on to reduce the speed of the spacecraft. Well, firstly we need to realise that to slow the spacecraft down, the rocket engines need to decrease the unbalanced force to the right. So in order to decrease the unbalanced force to the right, we need to have something that's causing a force to the left. So that means we need to have rocket engines R and S here switched on so that they are propelling out the way towards the right, causing a force to act to the left to decrease this unbalanced force to the right. And if you think about the other ones, if we were to switch on, say, engines P and Q, then that would just cause an even bigger unbalanced force to the right and an even bigger acceleration to the right. So we want a force here which is acting in that opposite direction, which is going to be towards the left from engines R and S being switched on. So that gives us the answer A. Question 10 says the weights of three masses on the surface of a planet are shown in the table. So we have mass in kilograms and weight in newtons, and it says the weight of a 6.0 kilogram mass on the surface of the planet is. Well firstly we need to find g, the gravitational field strength on the planet, and then the weight. And we can do that using any row in this table, they should give out the same value of gravitational field strength. So let's use w equals mg to find what g is, and let's just use the first row of data there, 0.5 kilograms and 4.4 newtons. So we've got 4.4 newtons for the weight is equal to 0.5 times g, and dividing both sides by 0.5 to get g on its own, we get g equals 8.8 .8 newtons per kilogram. We can then do another w equals mg calculation to find the weight of the 6 kilogram mass. So we have w equals mg is equal to 6.0 times 8.8 .8 using our answer of g from before, and if you put that into your calculator you should get an answer of 52.8 newtons, which is roughly 53 newtons. So that gives us the answer d. Question 11 says a hairdryer is connected to a 230 volt supply. The current in the hairdryer is 2.0 amps. The electrical charge that passes through the hairdryer in 5 minutes is. Well remember to calculate charge, we have an equation relating charge, current and time. So writing that down we have Q equals IT. Substituting in the numbers we have 2.0 for the current times 5 minutes but then I want to times that by 60 to get it into seconds because remember we always use seconds for time. So we have 2.0 times 5 times 60 and putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 600 coulombs. Notice we didn't need to use the voltage here of 230 volts there, that is just a distractor in there to try and put you off. So we have 600 coulombs here which is the answer C. Question 12 says the graph shows how the voltages across the components P, Q and R vary with current. So we've got voltage on the y axis and current on the x axis, we've then got straight lines P and R and Q as a curved line and we have some statements. So it says based on this graph a group of students make the following statements. Statement 1 says component P has a greater resistance than component R. Statement 2 component R has a greater resistance than component Q. And statement 3, component Q has a resistance that decreases as the current increases. Well let's have a look through each one and decide whether they're true or false. So statement 1, component P has a greater resistance than component R. Well if we look back at the graph, remember the gradient of the line on a voltage against current graph is going to give resistance. And we can say that the steeper the gradient, the greater the resistance. So that means here we could say that P is going to have a greater resistance than R since P is steeper than R. So that means our first statement there is true. Statement 2, component R has a greater resistance than component Q. Well now if we think about the steepness here for Q and R, R is the line there with the lowest steepness which means it's going to have the smallest resistance, whereas Q, even though it's a curve, will also have a higher resistance than R. So that means that R will have a greater resistance than Q is false. And we can just think about the tangent to this curve as if a straight line was to be drawn along at a tangent to that curve. So we can say that statement 2 is false, and lastly, component Q has a resistance that decreases as the current increases. Well, if we look back at the graph, you can see that as current increases, you can see if we were to draw a tangent to this curve, the steepness of the line would get smaller and smaller. And that means the resistance is actually decreasing there. So that means we can say that as current increases, the resistance of component Q decreases. So that final statement there is true. So that means we have 1 and 3 are correct, which gives us the answer D. Question 13 says a circuit is set up as shown, so we have a 12 volt battery, 
we have some resistors in parallel here, an ammeter A1 in series there, and then an ammeter A2 next to this resistor, and we have a voltmeter across this second resistor here. And it says that the resistors are identical. It then says which row in the table shows the reading on the voltmeter and possible readings on ammeters A1 and A2. Well, firstly, we need to remember that the voltage across each branch in a parallel circuit is equal to the supply voltage. Well, if we look back at our circuit diagram, we have a 12 volt supply voltage there, which means that the voltage across this branch and the voltage across this branch because they're in parallel must also have a voltage of 12 volts across them. So that means the voltmeter will measure a voltage of 12 volts across that resistor. So that means we can rule out options A and B because they have 6 volts across the voltmeter and we're looking at options C, D and E. Now you also need to be aware that current splits up through each branch in a parallel circuit. So that means the readings on ammeters A1 and A2 are not going to be the same. So we can rule out option C here. So we have our possible options D and E and let's have a look at the circuit diagram to determine which one it's going to be. So here the ammeter A1 is measuring the current that goes through the battery which is likely going to be the biggest current value. And that current passing through ammeter A1 is then going to split up through each of these two branches and then it's going to join up again at this point and then flow back through the battery. So the reading on ammeter A1 should be larger and the reading on ammeter A2 which is measuring the current through this single resistor is going to be smaller than A1. So we need a bigger value for A1 and a smaller value for A2. So that means we're going to look at 0.6 amps for A1 and 0.3 amps for A2 and we have our voltage of 12 volts. So our answer here must be E. Question 14 says which of the following symbols represents the thermistor? Well remember a thermistor is a temperature dependent resistor so it looks like a resistor with the rectangle but then it's also got an extra feature which is this thing here which looks like a big tick almost going through the rectangle. So our answer here is B. And if we look at the other symbols we have a loudspeaker for A, we have a bulb or a lamp for C, D is a fuse and E is a light dependent resistor otherwise known as an LDR. So our answer here must be B for the thermistor. Question 15 says two substances X and Y are both solid at 20 degrees Celsius. The substances have the same mass and are supplied with the same amount of energy per second. The graph shows how the temperature of each substance varies with time. So you'll see we have temperature in degrees Celsius on the Y axis and then we have time in seconds on the X axis and the graph shows two heating curves for substances X and Y. It then says a student uses information from the graph to make the following statements. Statement 1 says the specific heat capacity of the solid substance X is greater than that of the solid substance Y. Statement 2, substance X changes state at a higher temperature than substance Y. And lastly, statement 3, the specific latent heat of fusion of substance X is greater than that of substance Y. Well, let's look through each statement in turn and decide which ones are true or false. So for the first one, the specific heat capacity of the solid substance X is greater than that of the solid substance Y. For that, we need to think about the relationship between specific heat capacity and temperature because that's the information we have from the graph. So remember the equation for specific heat capacity is EH equals CM delta T and if we were to rearrange for C we get C equals EH over M delta T and then if we ignore the heat energy and the mass we get this relationship C is directly proportional to 1 over delta T. In other words, specific heat capacity is inversely proportional to the change in temperature or directly proportional to 1 over the change in temperature. So this means that as the temperature change increases, specific heat capacity decreases. So let's think about this statement, specific heat capacity of the solid substance X is greater than that of the solid substance Y. Well, if we look back at the graph, because X and Y both start off at 20 degrees Celsius, you can see that X has undergone a bigger change in temperature, whereas Y has undergone a smaller change in temperature, even though it takes longer. And that means if we think about our first statement, substance X undergoes a bigger change in temperature, which means it's going to have a smaller specific heat capacity. So that means that this first statement is false because Y actually has a bigger specific heat capacity than X. For statement two, substance X changes state at a higher temperature than substance Y. Again, looking back at the graph, the change in state is going to occur, remember, when temperature remains constant. So here we have our change in state going from this point to this point, and for substance Y, it goes from this point to this point. But you can clearly see that substance X undergoes this change in state at a higher temperature than substance Y. So that second statement is true. 
And lastly, statement 3, the specific latent heat of fusion of substance X is greater than that of substance Y. Well, for this one, we need to think about our relationship between specific latent heat of fusion and heat energy. So remember, we have the equation EH equals ML, or in this case, I'm writing EH equals MLF because we're talking about latent heat of fusion and not latent heat of vaporization. And if we ignore the mass, we can see that the specific latent heat of fusion is directly proportional to the heat energy. And from this equation, we can see that heat energy and change in temperature are directly proportional which means if there's a bigger change in temperature, that means there's a bigger heat energy supplied. And we said that substance X from the graph has a higher change in temperature, and therefore it's going to have a greater heat energy EH value, which means that LF will be bigger as well. So that means that specific latent heat of fusion of substance X is greater than that of substance Y. That is true because X has a bigger EH and therefore a bigger LF value. So that means we have statements two and three are correct here, which gives us the answer D. Question 16 says heat from the sun melts 1.6 kilograms of ice in 40 minutes. The minimum heat energy required to change 1.6 kilograms of ice at 0 degrees Celsius into water at 0 degrees Celsius is. Well here we've got a constant temperature and a change of state which is melting and that means we need to be thinking about specific latent heat. So here I'm going to write down the equation for specific latent heat EH equals ML but because we've got melting we're going to use LF to mean fusion i.e. specific latent heat of fusion in this case. And we're trying to find the minimum heat energy, so we're trying to find EH. And we can substitute in our values, so we've got 1.6 kilograms times 3.34 times 10 to the 5 joules per kilogram. And you'll find this value of the latent heat of fusion of water from the data sheet. You can then put that into your calculator and you should get an answer of 5.3 times 10 to the 5 joules, which is answer D. Question 17 says a cyclist is riding a bicycle along a level road. The combined mass of the cyclist and bicycle is 70.0 kilograms. The total contact area between the tyres and the road is 8.0 times 10 to the minus 4 metres squared. The average pressure exerted by the tyres on the road is. Well, in order to calculate pressure, we're going to use the equation P equals F over A, force per unit area. So we need to find a force first of all, since we're given the total contact area between the tyres and the road. So in order to find the force to use in that equation, our force is going to be given by the combined weight of the cyclist and bicycle here. So our force is equal to the weight, which is equal to mg, and we can plug in our values of 70.0 kilograms times 9.8 newtons per kilogram on the earth, and if you put that into your calculator, you should get a weight value of 686 newtons. So we can use that as our force in the pressure force and area equation. So we have P equals F over A, substituting in the numbers, gives us 686 divided by 8.0 times 10 to the minus 4. And I don't need to worry about counting how many tires I have here and so on, because we're told the total contact area was this value, not the contact area for each tire. So if it did say the contact area for each tire, was a certain value, then we'd have to multiply it by two to get the total contact area between the tires and the road. But we're fine in this case. So if you put that into your calculator, you should get an answer of 8.6 times 10 to the five pascals, which is the answer E. Question 18 says the average kinetic energy of a gas molecule can be determined using the following relationship. So we have EK equals three over two KBT, and you might not have seen this equation before, and that's because this is a skills question. So here we have an unseen formula or unseen equation, and we're told what each of the symbols are. So EK is the average kinetic energy of a gas molecule in joules. KB is Boltzmann's constant with a value of 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin and T is the temperature of a gas molecule in Kelvin. And then it says the average kinetic energy of a gas molecule at 100 degrees Celsius is. Well, with these types of questions, remember all you want to do is start with the equation and substitute in the numbers and make sure you're using the correct numbers and the correct units. So we have EK equals three over two times KBT. Substituting in the numbers gives us three over two times Boltzmann's constant, which is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 times 100 plus 273. And that's just taking our 100 degrees Celsius and adding 273 to change it into Kelvin. So if you put all that into your calculator, you should get an answer of 7.72 times 10 to the minus 21 joules, which is the answer E. Question 19 says, which of the following is a longitudinal wave? Well, from the waves topic, you might have only learned about one type of longitudinal waves, which is sound waves. So our answer here is A. All the others, like light and all these electromagnetic waves here, they are all types of transverse waves. So the only option here is sound waves. Question 20 says, a radio station transmits radio signals with a frequency range from 3.0 MHz to 6.0 MHz. 
the maximum wavelength of the radio signal transmitted is. Well first we need to realise that the maximum wavelength will occur for a minimum frequency, and that's because of the relationship between wavelength and frequency being an inverse one. So remember the bigger the frequency the smaller the wavelength, and vice versa. So we can say that maximum wavelength means minimum frequency, so we want to think about this 3.0 MHz here. So using the equation V equals F lambda, we want to find the maximum wavelength lambda, so let's substitute in the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second for these radio waves, since they are electromagnetic waves. So we have 3 times 10 to the 8 is equal to 3.0 times 10 to the 6, that's just taking the 3.0 MHz and converting it into Hertz, and then that's times by lambda. So if we divide both sides here by 3.0 times 10 to the 6, we should get a wavelength of 100 meters. So that is the answer D here. Question 21 says a student draws a diagram to show the bands of the electromagnetic spectrum in order of increasing wavelength. So it starts with gamma rays over here and it shows increasing wavelength down this way. Or another way of saying that is decreasing frequency down this way. And it says the diagram is not correct. Which two bands of the electromagnetic spectrum are in the wrong position? Well in the mnemonic that I remember, it's running through my bowl and vibrant underwear excites grannies. And that means that we'd start with radio and TV here, they're running through, and then we'd have my bowl and then it'd be in vibrant underwear. And that looks like these two here are in the wrong place and therefore should be swapped. So we can say that infrared and ultraviolet are in the wrong position, which is the answer C. Question 22 says a radioactive source emits alpha, beta and gamma radiations. Sheets of aluminium and paper are placed in front of the source as shown. So here we have our source, or 10 millimetres of aluminium, there's point P, and then we have some paper and point Q. It says which row in the table shows the radiations from the source detected at points P and Q. Well remember aluminium blocks both alpha and beta radiation. So if we look back at the picture, this aluminium here will block both alpha and beta, which means only gamma will get through to point P. So we only have gamma for this one, and we should also know that gamma rays can penetrate both aluminium and paper. So if we look back here, gamma rays will get through to point P, but they'll also get through to point Q because they'll pass through the paper. So we should have gamma rays detected at P, and gamma rays detected at Q. So we have gamma and gamma here, which is the answer E. Question 23 says a radioactive sample emits 3000 alpha particles in 2 minutes. The activity of the sample is... Well here we can use our equation for activity, number of decays and time. So we have A equals N over T, substituting in our numbers gives 3000 divided by 2 times 60, where we're just converting from 2 minutes into seconds. So if you put that into your calculator, you should get an answer of 25 becquerels, which is option A. Question 24 says a radioactive substance is to be injected into a patient so that blood flow can be monitored using a detector. So there's our patient and there's the detector. A number of different substances which emit either beta or gamma radiation are available. The substances have different half-lives. Which row in the table identifies the radiation emitted and the half-life of the most suitable substance? Well remember for radioactive tracers, we want the radiation emitted to be gamma radiation because that can penetrate through the whole body and it's not going to be stopped by any parts of the body. And then for half-life, we want a reasonable half-life that allows the radioactive tracer to be radioactive for long enough. So that means we'd want to go for two days for the half-life here, which means that after two days, the activity of that radioactive substance will decrease to half its original value. And that's more reasonable than say two seconds for the half-life because that means the radiation is going to decay too quickly to get any sufficient readings to be taken by the detector, and then a half-life of two years is just way too long. That means the activity is going to be at a harmful level for a longer time. So we want to go for gamma rays and two days, so that is the answer D here. Lastly, question 25 says rhodium-106 has a half-life of 30 seconds. A sample of rhodium-106 has an activity of 3200 becquerels. The activity of this sample after 120 seconds is... Well notice this is a half-life question and we're going to do it by calculation because there's no graph and you'll notice we're not trying to calculate the half-life in this one, we're actually trying to find the final activity of this sample. So we want to know the final activity after 120 seconds but the half-life is 30 seconds. So let's do a division first to find out how many half-lives are going to happen in that time. Well 120 divided by 30 will give us 4 half-lives which means we need 4 arrows. So we're going to start with the initial activity of 3200 becquerels, so we're going to start with our initial activity of 3200 becquerels and then we're going to half it four times to have four arrows. So halving that once gives us 1600 becquerels. 
Halving again gives us 800 becquerels. Halving again gives us 400 becquerels. And halving once more gives us 200 becquerels. So we've got four arrows which represent the four half-lives. And that means our final activity is 200 becquerels, which is answer C here. That's all for this video, folks. Thanks for watching. If you made it to the end, I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video a like, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.